well start. It's good to see you all uh, gathered out and just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, don't forget office prayers tomorrow night at 7.30 is the office prayers meeting in the church here and then Sunday services as usual 11 and 6.30. And don't forget it's also the last of the month as well and so that means then a cup of tea after the uh, service on Sunday night as well too. So I encourage you if you're able to to stay for that as well. We're going to begin our time by singing. Well, you don't need to guess. We're going to sing. You can see it on the screen behind me. What a faithful God of I. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. We'll just stay seated as we sing this one. in our lives and Father help us to be a, a thankful people to, to pause and to consider all that you have done for us Father we do pray Lord that you will uh, just as we even come here tonight Lord help us Lord just to, to give thanks for all that you have done but Father also to depend on you as we look to you for help even in this week we do want to give thanks for the warm space even that took place here yesterday and just for the lady who came into that, we give thanks for that. And Father, we do pray for this initiative that our churches are seeking to do here in Comfort. And we pray that others will also experience just encouragements and have opportunities to reach out. And Lord, help us as we seek to do that. And Lord, as we come to your word tonight and as we later pray together, Lord, just give us a sense of your presence here with us. And Father, just help us, Lord, as we study your word. And Lord, speak to us through it. And Father, as we pray, Lord, just help us to give us that boldness just to lift our hearts in prayer as we seek to pray to you and to give worship and praise and honour 
to the one who deserves all honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now well, let's turn in your Bibles to 3 John. Um, we can look at this three John, John letters, and so we come to the last of them tonight as we read 3 John together. There's a new little series of root time to start, but I'll tell you more about that, maybe God will on Sunday. But um, this third letter of John we come to, again, it's a short letter, but a letter that has a lot to say to us. So let's read it together. The elder to the beloved Gaius, or Gaius, whom I love and truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may have in good health, as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their, their journey in an honor worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who want to, and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I would hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. The best reading of his word. You know, the third letter of John is quite different in many ways because uh, the, uh, the first the reason why it's different is who it's written to. Second John, we looked at last week, uh, we talked about this elect lady who it's written to and her children, and we, uh, we told, saw how that was likely addressed to a, to a group of people, really the church. And there's multiple evidence for that. We talked about that last week. But this letter is different in that way because it's actually very personal in nature. Names are mentioned of various people in them. And the second way that's different in, is in its subject. It's almost like, I suppose, the flip side of Second John. Because Second John was cautioning believers about the danger of showing hospitality to those who are false teachers. Warned about the danger of entertaining false teachers, whereas Third John is about commending hospitality, but to those who are true teachers of the word. So he's urging people to to show hospitality here. So these books are are quite different, and um, individuals are mentioned personally. And aside from John, we're going to meet three other people tonight, and we're going to look at what John has to say about them, and also the lessons that we can learn from their lives. And the birth of these individuals we'll meet in this greeting here is a man called Gaius or Gaius. And who this later uh, who this letter is addressed to. Gaius we see the first thing we see about him really in verses one to four is that he's uh, a godly man. Now notice how John refers to to Gaius here. This word beloved or if you're reading from an NIV or a New Living translation, it says dear friend. He uses this word to speak of Gaius four times in this letter. And here's an individual who John clearly cared about, someone who he loved in the Lord. And we don't know an awful lot about the background of this man other than really than what John tells us here. And the reason for that is, is that um, Gaius was actually a really common name. And in fact, there are three others of them mentioned in Scripture. So there was one who travelled at one time with Paul. There was another from Corinth and another from, from Derby. So likely this man maybe isn't even one of these, or he maybe could be one of these. We, we're not sure. So, But John tells us a little bit about this man in, in this letter. First thing is we see he's one who loves the truth. And uh, Gaius was clearly a man who received the truth of the gospel. 
He was one who continued to live his life in the light of that gospel and follow Christ's commands. And clearly that was evident in his life. People could see that. And John writes to him again. Notice how he starts this letter. He addresses himself as the elder. And again, we talked a little bit about that last week. But, but John likely had some spiritual oversight over a number of churches. And so he wants to write this letter to encourage this man, Gaius. And as we read on, it seems that John had recently met some people who were telling him of some things that this brother had, had done. So he shares with uh, Gaius his desire for his prayer for his life in verse 2. Do you know, it's such an encouraging thing to know that someone prays for you. It is a very encouraging thing. And something that people like John <laughs> and Paul often do in their letters is to share of their prayers. That's something Paul does often in his letters. And he does the same, John does the very same thing here. He said, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So this man, Gaius, is doing well. And, and John really in this prayer is praying that he continue to do well. He prays for both his physical well-being, but also his spiritual well-being. You see, praying for someone's good health was actually a fairly normal thing in a Greek letter. And especially given the times and the ancient days that they were living in, where medical care maybe wasn't necessarily as quite as good as what it would be today. Um, and there was a quite low life expectancy as well. So this prayer for health was quite a normal thing. But notice this wasn't John's only priority. He prayed for him spiritually as well, that his soul would be healthy as well that he would continue to grow in the Lord and, and also remain in that truth. And you know, we can pray about the, the physical needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But it's also good for us to pray for their spiritual needs as well, to pray that they would be encouraged in the Lord, to pray that even maybe in that time of suffering that they would be either physically strengthened or even inwardly strengthened as well too. And, you know, John was one who prayed for this man, Gaius. You see, he delighted in what he heard about him. Look at verse 3. John says he recently met some brothers who told him of this man and his life and how he was walking in the truth. So he was a man of faith who he received the truth and he was walking in the truth. He didn't just talk the talk. He was, he was walking the walk in his life. And we see a little bit of an indication in verse 5. Who were these brothers? You get a bit of an indication who it was. These were people who had seen this man had shown kindness to. And he likely shown hospitality to him. And many people think these men were itinerant ministers of the gospel. Really, that was why they were uh, that then had arrived. And John had come into contact with them as well. And they were talking of how this man, Gaius, had given them their hospitality. And John says in verse 4, he rejoiced greatly. And he says in verse 4, I have no greater joy that my children are walking in the truth. So when you think about it, John and his ministry must have had many spiritual children. He maybe was responsible for leading so many people to the Lord, or, or even there was others, I'm sure, whose life he had caused to, to feed into and to, to help them grow as believers. And you know, for any parent, there is no greater delight than to see a child grow, to see them learn to walk, to see them learn to talk, to learn even grasp new things. And John had that delight as well, I'm sure, like a, a, a parent, when he saw how those who maybe he had pointed to Christ were continuing on their faith. And not only that, there was evidence of that fruit in their lives, that fruit of the Spirit. And there was no greater joy for him than that. And, you know, there is no greater joy for any uh, minister or pastor than to see people growing in the Lord, to see them responding to God's Word. and. I'm not talk, talking about the things that people say at the door and on the way out, but I'm talking about the greatest joy is to see when the, the, the seed of God's word takes root in someone's life and bears fruit, bears spiritual fruit in their life. And that's a great joy. Or maybe even to see um, how it, even someone's burden increased for the lost, even to see that response. Or to see someone discovering an aspect of God's truth maybe they never realised or, or thought about before. You know, that's such an encouraging thing. It really is. They see people responding to God's word. And here this man, Gaius, was a, a godly man who's walking in the truth. And he was living his life faithfully. 
But we see something else about him uh, in verses 5 to 8, that he was a loving brother. He was a loving brother. Once more, uh, John writes, Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified of your love before the church. These people had visited this man and uh, he had sought to care for them. These were people who were true teachers of the word and uh, we were warned about the, the, the other side of that last week, to not be entertain false teachers. But here when true teachers and ministers of the gospel came to this man, Gaius, you know, these early ministers of the gospel, these early missionaries, really, they were so vital because this was how the early church grew. They were traveling around, spreading the gospel around these towns as well. People like the disciples and then those who made, they made disciples, and then those disciples made disciples too. And that was how the gospel grew, through people like this making their way around various cities and towns. And the thing is, these believers were often so dependent on the kindness and hospitality of God's people in these house churches. The brothers had, these brothers had testified of, of the care that they'd received from this man, uh, Gaius. And he gives thanks that Gaius had sent them on their journey, he says, in a manner worthy of the Lord. So, you know, this little phrase, uh, send them on their way. It's an interesting little phrase in verse 6. Because the Greek behind this means that to assist someone on their journey in a very practical way. It doesn't just mean, sure, I hope you have a nice nice time there, you know, and hope all goes well. But what it means is that this man also supported them in some way in doing that. Maybe he supplied food, uh, maybe uh, money even to help uh, their expenses. He maybe even arranged others to travel with them. Uh, sometimes that happened as well. I mean, Paul had many traveling companions travel with him and others were at him along in some of his journeys. Uh, or even maybe a, a, a way of travel, a means of travel. But this man helped them in a manner worthy of God. And here it reminds us these were people who were going forth and in the sake of the Lord's name. They were doing this not to make a name for themselves, but to proclaim the Lord. They were servants of God, people who were willing to leave friends and family, willing to endure hardship to minister the gospel. And that was part of this man's service to the Lord, was to care for these people. He maybe had another ministry of his own in that house church, but he saw this also as an important ministry too, to show hospitality and to, to support these people where he could. See, God had poured his love upon him, and so this man wanted to show love towards others who were fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. These workers relied on people like Gaius. They, they didn't accept anything from others. Verse 7, it speaks of, uh, they didn't even have help from the, the Gentiles. They didn't accept help from them. And that's not the usual word for Gentiles there. It's a word that refers to um, outsiders. It's talking about the non-believing Gentiles. So in other words, they didn't accept help from non-believers. It was only those who were fellow Christians who helped and supported them in their ministry. And the thing is, John says in verse 8, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Not everyone will be called to go to the mission field or to go to a foreign country, but all have a part to play in the work of missions. If we can't go, we can pray. We can also give as well. And that's something we do each Tuesday evening as well when the offering goes to the work of missions. And we have dedicated prayer times as well for missions. And it is good to get even those Baptist missions updates or whatever other updates. Uh, uh, maybe there's another missionary society also you're interested in too. But it's good and important to pray and to give towards the work of missions. You know, this man, Gaius, was a, a godly man. He was a, a loving brother in Christ. But sadly, not all had this man's heart. And the next one we're introduced to, this next character, is a man called Diotrephes, verses 9 to 11. And for him, well, he's a dangerous man. John says, I've written something to the church, likely talking here about another letter that we don't have. Um, John has written another letter. Some suggest, you know, maybe this is talking about Second John, but Certainly what John says in Second John doesn't fit with these verses about the autophy. So I think this is another letter that we don't have. But he's already written a letter to this church about this individual. 
who, unlike Gaius, he isn't living a godly life. And we don't know any other background about Diotrephes other than what we read here. And even though there's only a few short verses, what a terrible legacy this man left behind. It's clear from these verses, Diotrephes was a, a leader within the church, but he was a leader who abused his position. What we read of him isn't good. The first thing is, he's a man filled with pride. He was a man who liked to put himself first. Do you know, sadly, struggles for, for power and status are nothing new within the church. Even throughout history, scripture we see it. Throughout history we've seen it as well. And pride is not a desirable quality amongst the Lord's people. It's not. The book of Proverbs has much to say about pride. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 17. And you'll know these verses because it's, it's verses which speak of six things that the Lord hates. And it talks about six things the Lord hates and seven are an abomination to him. And what comes first in that list? It's haughty eyes, or in other words, a proud look. The Lord hates pride. There's several other verses we could read in Proverbs, but I'm just going to read one more. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Everyone who is arrogant and hard is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. This was a man, Diotrephes, who loved to be the centre of attention. He was filled with pride. He wanted to be number one, and he, he did that at the expense of others. Here was a man who, on a Sunday, I suppose he wasn't really singing how great thou art, but he was more singing how great he was. He was more comfortable singing that. What a sad state of affairs. Filled with pride. The Lord hates pride. But he was also a man who, secondly, he rejected authority. He rejected authority. Geographies didn't even acknowledge the authority of John. Now, consider that for a moment. John was one of the apostles who was commissioned by Christ himself to go and make disciples. Commissioned by none other than the Lord himself. Not only that, he was one of his disciples. He was one of even the inner circle. There was like a, a smaller group of disciples who were particularly close to Jesus. John was that disciple whom Jesus, uh, Jesus loved. And, you know, John was one who was even there at the very crucifixion. He also visited the empty tomb and he talked with the risen Christ. Here was a man who, if anyone had to claim authority, surely it was John, wasn't it? And yet all of this didn't matter to the other things. He wasn't interested in what John had to say. He rejected his teaching. How arrogant that such a man would reject even the teaching of John, a one who had been personally taught by Jesus. You know, this is not how it's to be. Hebrews 13, 17 addresses the church and it says, We are to obey our leaders and submit to them, for, for they're keeping a watch over your souls. And as such, I have to give an account for that. You know, are we willing to submit the proper authority? And John says in this letter, he's going to deal with the author of faith. He's going to deal. He says, if I come to you, and clearly by the end of the, this letter, that's what John's intending to do. And he says, I'll bring up what he's doing. He's not going to ignore this issue. He's going to put a stop to this man's behavior. He's a man filled with pride, a man who rejects authority. But the third thing, he's one who's spreading lies and rumour. He's a man who's guilty of gossip and slander. The Diotrephes was seeking to harm the character and to damage the very authority of John himself through talking wicked nonsense against him. He was bad-mouthing him, making false charges. And John sees it, he sees it as nonsense. Useless talk. And you know, sadly, such a thing can be common in church life for people slandering one another, either slandering those in uh, authority in the church or else, sadly, even church leaders slandering other church leaders. How sad that is. And it's a very great danger, the danger even of the tongue. Because what does James say? James chapter 3, verse 6, The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members. Staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. It's like a fire. And what does a fire do? It spreads. It spreads. As one writer says, such talk of diatrophies, his talk was hell bent and hell bound. His tongue needed to be tamed, for it set the whole church on fire. 
And how sad some gossip consent can cause havoc within a church. You know, here was a man, Diotrephes, who didn't care about anyone else. He was only interested in his own selfish ambition and he was never satisfied as well by that. He wasn't content because there's something else he was doing. That's the very last thing for Diotrephes. He's a man who lacks love as well. Unlike Gaius, who was welcoming these itinerant preachers, Diotrephes refused to welcome the brothers. Now, many people say, was Diotrephes in the same church as Gaius, or is he, is he in a neighbouring church that's impacting them? Again, we don't know that. But basically, Diotrephes was going up to people who were showing hospitality uh, to those who were Christian preachers. And what he was saying was, don't be doing that. If you do it again, you're right. You know, proper church discipline, uh, excommunication can be a part of church discipline if people refuse repeatedly to repent. But what Diotrephes was doing was not proper church discipline. His was an abuse of power. He was imposing his will above all others. And he was operating on his own ideas and desires. But how do people respond to this? Now, I don't have a, a point up about this in the slide, but look at verse 11, because here we see how John wants Gaius to respond to this. You know, it says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Sometimes when others do wrong against us or say an unkind word about us, it can be easy at times to fight fire with fire. We're tempted to lash out, but he's urging Gaius, don't do that. Don't descend to this man's level. Don't imitate evil uh, for evil, but rather continue to do good. See, he'd been, Gaius had been living faithfully and in accordance with the gospel and the teaching of Jesus. And so he was to continue to do so. For he reminds him, whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. You know, in other words, what does your manner of life show? And he didn't want Gaius to, to adopt those same sinful patterns that this man Diotrephes had. You know, we don't need to resort to evil to fight evil. The Bible often commands us, commands us rather, to leave judgment to God, to carry on doing what is right. In other words, leave God to deal with them and carry on doing right. Otherwise, if we fight fire with fire, we become evil bears ourselves. But then John mentions another character. And it's a man called Demetrius. Here's a man with a good reputation. Verse 12. Unlike Diotrephes, this is really only Demetrius' his only, his only mention. He's received good testimony from everyone. You know, you might wonder, why does John mention Demetrius here? There are many people think that actually Demetrius may have been the courier of the letter. Apparently in, in ancient times it was common practice for the courier uh, for them to be written about in the letter. More or less saying, this man who's giving you the letter, you can trust him. You can trust what he says. And there's good reason for that. And that was because if you've written a letter and you've given it to someone to deliver, well, often when the person read that letter, if they had any doubts and wondered, what does what did he mean by that? Well, often the person carrying the letter said, well, he meant he wanted to tell you such and such. That person often would help interpret the letter. Or how did he seem, you know, when the letter was sent? Do you know how it is when you get a text message? Sometimes people can, you can read things the wrong way, can't you? Well, the same thing in a letter, an ancient form of text message. <laughs> uh, this letter, when they got it, you know, how did this, you might have wondered, how did it, how did he come across? Was John, was John really angry when he sent this? The letter, the one who was delivering the letter could, could talk about that. So, John says this man, Demetrius, everyone has a good testimony from everyone. And, you know, here he's had a good, he's a good reputation. He's won a good reputation, it says, even from the truth itself, meaning this man lives according to the truth of the gospel. And John says, you can, we can add our own testimony here too. Even though we don't have much about Demetrius, what a good legacy he left behind. Everyone speaks good about him. You know, I wonder what legacy we would leave behind. I wonder what people would say about us. It's a challenge, isn't it? I wonder what people would say. What's the thing maybe even that marks us out in our life? It is a challenge to our hearts, but 
Lastly, I want you to look how the, the, the letter closes with some personal remarks from John. And the last character we're introduced to is John himself. John, a man with the pastor's heart. Verses 13 to 15. And you'll notice from last week's second John, this is very similar. It's nearly identical, in fact. Don't you any differences? As he draws to a close, you see John longs to visit this man, Gaius. He's much to say. He'd rather not do it in pen and paper. He'd rather talk to him face to face. And so we see he cares for him. And he doesn't just care for Gaius. He cares for those in the church. He writes peace to you. Diotrephes had disturbed the peace. And so John longs for it to be restored. And of course, that word peace, it's, it's similar to the Old Testament uh, uh, concept of shalom. That's, that's the Hebrew word for peace. And they used to use peace as a greeting to people. It means more than absence of conflict. It also speaks of blessing as well. He longs for blessing and being believers. He cares for them. He cares for guys and he cares for the other believers. He even says, greet the other believers. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. You know, in other words, if we put it in modern day terms, he would say, tell so and so I'm after, right? We would do that. That's how we would do it. John says the same. See, this letter, Though it's a short letter, it's an important message. It speaks through all the lives of these different characters. But I wonder which one we resemble. May God give us a heart of love, not just for him, but also for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And may we continue to walk in truth and to walk faithful. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for this little letter, but with a very important message of how we are to walk in love and truth. And Father, we see an example of, of some who did walk in truth, and others who didn't, others who strayed. Father, help us to keep a watch over our own spiritual life, to not get lax in that, to never get cold in our love, even as we saw about the church in Ephesus on Sunday. Help us not to be like that. Help us to guard our walk. To even show affection even for our brothers and sisters in Christ. For Father, they are also loved by you. They're made in your image. And so, Lord, we love them as fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so help us, Lord, even to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ tonight. Lord, we ask that you will help us even as we pray just now. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.